of the foods that you want to include in your diet. And all foods are available in many versions. And uh, seeking out the highest quality version will get you more nutrient density, more nutrients per calorie. So, um, for instance, we can take a look at oatmeal. Maybe some of you have eaten a bowl of oatmeal lately. Um, that food, like all of them, comes in a wide variety of um, quality. You can start maybe with um, the high quality, which might be steel cut oats grown locally last fall, stored in your pantry in a glass jar, and um, they're delicious and you can smell their nutty flavor and um, their texture and the soluble and insoluble fibers and essential fatty acids are really um, important in that food. And um, however, all oats are not alike. If you do go with steel cut oats that are local, uh, perhaps you even thought ahead and soaked them overnight with a dollop of yogurt or whey to increase their digestibility and nutrient availability, enzymes. And um, then in the morning you simmer them, perhaps with cinnamon, and you put on some fresh raw butter and uh, real local maple syrup up here. Um, contrast that scenario with um, ripping open a box and tearing open a packet of stale, pre-cooked oats, <coughs> powder yolks, they're odorless, colorless, and you pour them in a bowl, a plastic bowl that goes in the microwave, and uh, reconstitute them, and then they're scalding hot, and you can smell the flavors that have been added to mimic real foods. And um, this scenario is true of pretty much every food under the sun these days, based on the way that they're grown, and then processed, and how fresh they are, and then how you prepare them at home, you affect their quality. And again, quality is nutrients per calorie. Um, so when you think about their nutritional profiles, digestibility, flavor, texture, and health impact, the oatmeal versions don't really resemble each other at all. Um, I almost wish we had different names. I've, I've come up with a new idea for organic since that's been kind of taken over by the feds and, and nationalized. Um, maybe we could go to raw organic, you know, real organic. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, today I aim to give you a tool so that you can uh, begin to assess the quality, qualitative differences um, in food so that you become a discerning eater and a qualivore. Um, you can stop accumulating the negative effects of a lifetime of poor eating you know, eating low quality industrial foods. And you can be sp uh, quick to spot high quality foods and quick to walk away from those that really don't deliver much to you. So I do challenge you to experience the freedoms linked to getting off industrial foods. I did term, um, come up with a couple of other vores. Um, I've met other um, types of eaters in the years that I've been a nutritionist. One is the scavengivore who really just goes from free meal to free meal or whatever happens to be available, edible or not. Um, there's also the bargivore who's shopping around for the best deal, probably the biggest quantity, often the lowest uh, quality. And um, there's the trendivore, you know, who goes from the trendy food of the moment, if it's agave or who knows what it is these days. So anyway, a qualivore is a person who, who learns to assess foods based on their fundamental nourishment value. He seeks out the best quality available and gets over the idea that there is a particular food that's um, important in the diet and rather um, than shuffling around them, it, you know, quasi-quality food and um, creating a diet based on which foods, um, it's more about which quality of the foods. So the adage, a rose is a rose or an egg is an egg, just really doesn't hold true with food. Um, what you need to hold in mind when you're thinking about what to eat is what was the original environment in which the food was grown? All food is grown in the earth somewhere, and that original environment gives its in internal integrity. From, from that moment at harvest on, you can't do much to increase the nutritional value unless you're fortifying and enriching, and usually that's done after a food has been processed to death and is devoid of nutrients altogether. So you want to think about the original environment, the farm environment, and then how it's processed or not. And I'm not just talking about whole foods. I really think that 
um, when you're trying to get away from processed foods. Whole is a term that's um, not as meaningful perhaps as it used to be unless you're talking about maybe a whole fruit or a whole vegetable that, that you can eat that way. Um, I mean intact. So just because a bread may say it's got whole grains in it, oftentimes they have been pulverized and exposed to damaging techniques so that they're, they're not intact anymore. And that's true of proteins and fats. Um, then after that, you think about how fresh it is and how it's prepared. So these four factors are more fundamental than carbs um, or grams of uh, protein and milligrams of vitamin D or calcium. And we can get into those in a little bit more, a few minutes. Um, my second agenda here today is to show you that foods are a function of liberty and that they are an integral part of being a libertarian. Physical freedom is a large part of a free life. What good is it to have many legal opportunities and liberties if you're too ill and disabled to enjoy them? You don't need to be a slave to disease and pain caused by a lifetime of eating industrial foods. Um, there Diabetes, heart disease, and cancer are optional in many cases, and they're known to be greatly influenced, if not caused, by diet. When you eat nutrient-dense, high-quality food, you sustain your systems, you age slower, and need fewer pharmaceuticals and medical interventions. The quality of your life seems stays high. And that's really what I advocate. I think that we can reach our peak somewhere you know, midlife, and the idea is to maintain that high quality of life free of disease and then suddenly plummet to death rather than get <laughs> to your peak and have this slow strip tease of um, health <laughs> all the way your last half of your life is spent just being stripped of your, your health and um, freedom physically from medications that often don't work. Um, so there's nothing at all free about that. Fo food is political and um, you know, every word on food labels is haggled over and defined by corporate interests. Many of the foods you eat are subsidized, but with your tax dollars. The government makes dietary recommendations to its citizens and enforces them in schools, prisons, government-run health clinics and institutions. Food production is regulated by the government with a bias toward massive corporate industrial farms. And there are few decisions a farmer can make without being constrained by state and federal laws. Unlike the small farmer who would go out of business pretty quickly if he fouled his land or his foods harmed the people in his community, his neighbors, um, corporations are not held accountable for the effects of their policies and products. The costs of big agriculture are not fit factored into the food costs, but they're considered external, so industrial foods do appear to be falsely economical or falsely inexpensive. New technologies, ingredients, and products spawn more regulations. The result is that diverse family farms are becoming extinct and the quality of our foods is deteriorating and our soils are depleted. The health of our nation is declining and the number one source of environmental pollution comes from agriculture. Now is the time to invest in high quality foods before the small farmers are put out of business by ever tightening regulations and fees. Farmers are being squelched and pinched by new legislation that restricts the sale of their products and onerous red tape that inhibits creative, sustainable farming techniques. Independent food farmers are facing pressures that put them out of business. If we don't support them, we may not have access to any foods other than industrial. So as libertarians, we need to protect our rights to grow and eat nourishing foods. As I speak here now, the government is challenging whether we citizens have any rights at all to determine what we eat. Just in September, um, Cir Circuit Court Judge Patrick Fielder in Wisconsin declared that citizens have no right to produce or eat foods of their own choice, nor do they have a fundamental right to drink milk from their own cow. Judge Fielder was responding to a request from the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund about a case involving a group of families who boarded their cows on a farmer's farm. Um, Judge Fielder said that in effect the farm had become a dairy farm, which made them subject to the state rules uh, governing dairy farms, which are generally geared toward big corporate farms and not the small farmer. So Judge Fielder's unprecedented perspective on food was so shocking he was prodded to clarify his assessment of the constitutionality of food rights. Judge uh, 
Fielder expanded on his original statement that such constitutional issues are wholly without merit, and I quote. Um, he stressed five points. Plaintiffs do not have a fundamental right to own and use a dairy cow or a dairy herd. Plaintiffs do not have a fundamental right to consume the milk of their own cow. Plaintiffs do not have a fundamental right to board their cow at the farm of a farmer. The plaintiff's private contract with the farmer does not fall outside the scope of the state's police power. And lastly, plaintiffs do not have a fundamental right to produce and consume the foods of their choice. So every day, our right to decide what to eat are being infringed upon, often in the name of food safety. Free state project members espouse liberty. Make sure that your food cho choices are in alignment with your political and social values. Exercise your rights to obtain helpful foods and do this by growing foods, supporting your regional producers, and hunting, fishing, foraging. You'll reap many ben benefits that enhance the libertarian lifestyle. If you're here today, you're committed to freedom and um, we need to maintain legal access to ra raise foods that are free of genetic engineered organisms and unadulterated by chemicals and processing. So back to how to use uh, the qualitative perspective on your foods um, I, so that you can become a libertarian qualivore. So to obtain the most nutrients per calorie, with the fewest agricultural residues, you need to consider the four factors, where a food is grown and the environment that originally gave the food that initial integrity, uh, the processes that the food underwent after harvest, and the freshness of the food, which is really time and distance, locality, you know, regional and local and seasonal, and the preparation methods used to create a meal. Think of each of these four factors as tiers, and soil is the most important, um, it's primary, and on top of that comes processing, and next is freshness, and then how you prepare it, and then you get this overall sense of the quality of your food. So when you mull over your options for dinner tonight, try to think about each of those four factors and um, mull over really what happened to your food and, and ask the questions that will give you some answers and listen to the answers. Soil is the source of all food, plant and animal. Soil is a dynamic living system unlike any other life form. The most crucial element in soil is humus and um, microbes in humus free uh, minerals from the soil and create compounds that plants can absorb and use to become healthy plants. Um, soil is as an ever-changing yet stable form of live organic material that comes from decomposed plant and animal matter. Humus is both the product of living matter and the source of it, and there is no better growing medium. Humus-rich soils produce great food for us and livestock. They're, they're the plants are strong and they don't require a lot of interventions and pesticides and herbicides and management. So they produce excellent food. In contrast, industrial farms destroy soil with heavy machinery, chemicals, monocropping, and they, they essentially are growing sick plants that need medication. The quality of these two types of food production is vastly different. So start with that, that factor, and processing is generally not going to improve it. Um, Second, after harvest, do think about the processing that occurs to your food. Um, especially, you know, if you if you get the soil thing and you start to farm, uh, find organic farms, or, or maybe not even organic. These days that word is hard to understand anymore because it's been nationalized and um, oftentimes a small farmer who farms better than what's stated in the list of what's allowed to be called certified organic. Um, a small farmer can't call himself organic because he doesn't have the money to go through all the certification processes and um, just isn't going to earn enough off his harvest to do that. But if you go on the premises and speak to the farmer and see the environment, you can assess for yourself the quality of the farm environment. Um, so after you do that assessment, then you can decide how the animal or plant is processed. And processing takes foods apart. It generally degrades foods with exposure to air, light, heat, pressure, and all sorts of other adulteriz adulterizations. Um, processed foods are generally on the low end of, of the second tier in the, in the spectrum. 
Um, if they're processed, they just don't contain the nutrients that were initially there. Processed industrial foods are so devoid of nutrients and flavor that they require fortifications and expensive media marketing, packaging, synthetic flavors, colors, textures, just simply to get you to eat them. It's optimistic to hope that your body doesn't absorb all that stuff that's been added to your foods, um, but it's, it's not very likely that you excrete them without effort. The bottom line is that no one knows the cumulative long-term effects of eating processed foods, although overwhelming data does show that it would be wise to stay away from them. So consider how processing methods affect the foods you like to eat and strive to obtain intact foods. Freshness is the third level of food quality and is determined by season and region. It's a function of time and distance. Fresh foods mean that they're vital with inherent enzymes intact. They're more alive than dead and they impart, impart nourishment to you. You can detect freshness with your senses. Fresh foods look, smell, smell feel, taste, and even sound good. And they cook and they preserve well. Uh, when food, foods are grown in fertile soil and harvested ripe, quickly delivered to market, purchased within a few hours or days, and eaten soon, they're fresh. Um, they're not droplets of, of water on a vegetable or a certain waxy sheen. I think we know better. Um, freshness applies to all of your foods, not just fruits and vegetables. It's animal products and oils and grains and everything. Animals themselves are very discerning about what they eat, and you should be too. Hunters and farmers are food experts because they understand foods more intimately in their natural environment. They, um, they're selective about what they eat. And you can imagine a, a hunter, say, a turkey hunter, out in the field sighting a flock of birds and just, just imagine he sees in amongst the flock um, a, a, an industrial raised turkey <laughs> staggering along, you know, atrophied because it's been confined and you know, breasts so heavy it can hardly move. Um, and the hunter's sort of like, what's wrong with that bird? I, I hope it's not contagious. Uh, but certainly, <laughs> the last thing that hunter's gonna do is choose that one from the flock. I might choose to put out his misery. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> um, But you know, to shoot and, and dress that bird and eat it just isn't, it wouldn't occur to a hunter. Um, and he aims to select the best turkey possible and put his efforts toward getting the nutrients that that wild organism has to provide. So the nourishing power of living organisms, our foods, is their ability to impart life-sustaining components, which are enzymes and nutrients. And I'll label those very well. All foods are grown naturally at specific times of year and in particular locations. When foods grow during their appropriate seasons, they receive nature's full support which is passed on to you. Um, seasonal foods get the right air, soil, light, temperatures. They thrive without as much human effort. Their nutrients are alive and intact and abundant. When you eat seasonal ripe foods, you get the most nutrients, peak flavors, more varieties of that particular food, and um, variety in your annual diet. And regional foods are also more economical, varied, safe, and fresh foods um, than foods that come from long distances. Degrading events can occur between the time of harvest and the time you get them. The World Watch Institute estimates that the average food item in the U.S. travels 1,500 miles from harvest to your table and changes hands at least six times along the way. Nine-tenths of all foods consumed in the U.S. are not local. Food manufacturers take advantage of the vast distances between you and your origins of foods um, your ignorance about foods permits the low-quality supermarket products. So don't rely on industrial corporations to dictate what gets to market. This is a dangerous situation because agribusiness corporations don't have your health in mind. Decrease the distance between you and the origins of your food. You don't need to limit yourself beyond reason. Your bioregion can fluctuate. Um, it certainly does in the summer you're likely to get 50 to 90% of your foods locally, and in the winter, perhaps you expand your bioregion to include Florida or California. That's a personal decision. There's no one right way. You can, you can get a grip on it stepwise as you become a qualivore. It's a never-ending process of improving the quality of your foods. And lastly, preparation methods are the fourth, fourth tier that builds foods level of quality. 
How a food is prepared can enhance nutrient availability, digestibility, or it can further degrade the food. Preparing foods in your kitchen completes the eating lifestyle of the qualivore. It, you start with intact, seasonal, properly grown food and add your personal touch. But that does mean cooking. <laughs> you don't need to be especially bright or coordinated to, to cook and provide foods for yourself from scratch at home. If you can use a copier, pump gas into your car, you know you can take care of yourself in the kitchen. The skills are really, really simple. Home cooking is nearly a thing of the past in America. It's becoming absurd to say, I'm making dinner these days because most foods consumed, including those eaten at home, are made in factories somewhere far away. Processed industrial foods have replaced traditional foods, the act of cooking, and the routine of meal times. Most of you probably have eaten homemade foods, and you know the difference between factory foods and a fresh meal cooked in a kitchen by someone you know. Um, you've probably seen people wash and cut and pound and peel and grate and roll out the dough, and there's, there's, there's a value added to that um, personal uh, activity and participation with your food. The end results are worth it, and the time was well spent. Cooking at home is, is, is actually a privilege. It's an honorable responsibility. Valuable techniques, recipes, traditions, and family lore are being buried with our elders as people forget or choose not to cook. The time spent working together in the kitchen, which can really be relationship building, are being lost. So learn a few techniques, and if you, if you can't, there are personal chefs out there or cooking classes and ways to obtain homemade foods. So do try practicing these four, using these four factors when you're selecting your foods, wherever you are, at, at a restaurant, out at a farm, or at a friend's house, or what you're deciding to make for dinner. Think about the four factors that come into, into quality. I'd like to illustrate again the concept that foods come in a wide range of quality, and I'd like to use milk for an, as an example. These days, raw milk is really under fire. Um, it's, seem to be marked by the government to eradicate the sale of raw milk. Um, it's, milk is a staple food of many nations and it's easy to assume that it merits its place in your diet, but again, the issue is which milk, which version of quality. A carton of industrial milk from a superstore is extremely different from a glass jar of milk from a local dairy. Dr. William Campbell Douglas says it well, Biochemically, enzymatically, and nutritionally, industrial milk is about as close to raw milk as non-dairy creamer is to cream. <laughs> so let's start with low quality. Industrial milk comes from cows that are confined indoors, immobilized in tiny pens, surrounded by thousands of other cows. These massive factory dairies are designed to extract the most milk with the least human effort. Cows stand on concrete in their own excrement, unable to move. Um, without fresh air, they require antibiotics to treat mastitis, laminitis, and other pervasive infections that spread quickly through crowded conditions. The residues of these antibiotics and hormones and pus are permitted in industrial milk, along with metabolites of all the chemicals in cow feed, and they affect your growth and fertility and thyroid function as well. It's no surprise that milk allergies are on the rise Instead of grass, which is the only food that cows are designed to eat, confined cows are fed genetically engineered, pesticide-laden grains, and byproducts of other industries. After milk leaves the industrial cow, it's pooled with milk from that facility, thousands of other cows often. Then it's trucked to a processing plant where it's pooled with milk from other processing plants uh, or other initial dairies. So in this system, only one unhygienic farm can bring down the quality of all the milk. Once pooled, milk undergoes separation, homogenization, pasteurization. Homogenization breaks down the fat molecules and makes it a uniform texture, but it makes a product that spoils quickly. Pasteurization um, basically cooks milk that, so that it is no longer harmful. The, the bacteria in it is usually a high bacterial count, um, but, but the bacterial life is still in there. They're dead, but they're still permitted in the milk. They're not strained out somehow. So it's cooked milk. 
um, then additives um, are put into the milk, A and D, minerals and flavorings, which should have been there. They're not anymore because they're not in the feed. So then milk takes its second long journey to nationwide <coughs> grocery stores and it's old by the time you buy it. By contrast, raw milk from local organic dairies comes from cows grazing outdoors on healthy pastures. The fresh air, sunshine, weather, room to roam, and a diet of mixed grasses makes healthy cows who can produce healthy milk. And they don't need um, growth enhancement or pesticides or herbicides in their food and a bunch of medicines to keep them well because they're in an environment that keeps them well. Raw cow's milk is bottled directly without pooling from other dairies and separating, homogenizing, and pasteurizing or additions of the nutrients that should have been there initially. And then it's sold to the consumer quickly, and it's fresh. Raw milk, butter, cheeses from pasture cows are the ultimate high-quality food. They differ from industrial dairy in their nutrient composition, freshness, and effects on your health. Many people who are allergic to industrial milk are not allergic to raw cow's milk. It's, it's been known historically to be an extremely nutritious food to eat. Um, the persistent hype in the media, schools, medical field, government about industrial milk's importance in our diet is uh, based upon the characteristics of raw milk um, uh, from pasture cows, not on industrial milk. Shameless corporate protectionism and blatant disregard for public health prop up industrial milk industry. Uh, industrial milk is subsidized with your tax dollars, keeping its price falsely low, whereas small dairies that supply raw milk do not receive subsidies. Rather, they face hurdles to establishing a viable business. The sale of raw milk is actually illegal in many states, although New Hampshire is a good place to live to get raw milk. Judging from the current trend of federalizing food laws, you better be protective of what you have at the moment. Um, it won't be long before industry pressure persuades the government to eradicate state control of food altogether. So that's just one examination of another food. We've done oats and we've done milk, and you can you can do that for any food. Um, don't let the wrong issues guide your food choices, such as price, quantity, convenience and entertainment value. Discard these irrelevant factors and instead choose foods based on their quality. And here are six suggestions to initiate your transition from industrial foods to high quality foods. Um, the biggest impact you can make is to get um, away from all white sugar and white flour. They're processed beyond any worth in your value, it, value in your diet. Um, and they, they do trigger insulin, which causes a whole host of, um, of health effects that are deleterious. Address the top five foods you eat most. Start there. You don't need to run home and just clean out your pantry and, and, and try to get better quality foods all at once overnight and just throw out everything. So what do you eat most? What do you shop for most? Start with the foods that make the greatest volume of your diet and improve those. And sometimes improvements are, are you don't go from A to Z initially. You might go from industrial cow's milk to organic, okay and then you find your raw milk dairy producer. So it's, it's an ongoing process that can continue based on your region and um, the food producers in your area. Um, so another thing that's important in the diet to become a qualivore is eat fermented foods. And uh, I'm having a little kombucha here. It's a great way to have some fermented foods. Um, they repopulate your intestinal flora, which can help undo some of the um, effects of antibiotics that you get in the foods, and they offer live enzymes and are nutrient dense. Another thing is to drink filtered water. I recently got a Berkey filter system, and I'm really happy with that. It's low tech, it's stainless steel, the filters are excellent. You can get a fluoride filter. I think it's a great way, it's about four cents a gallon. Um, another thing to do is ask questions before you eat. Just ask them instead of denying them and blocking them out and saying, oh, I know it's not good for me, but um, you know, what is it? Where did it come from? What was it like when it was alive? Is it a healthy version of what it was supposed to be? Um, if you really don't know what you're eating, don't eat it. Um, lastly, um, be willing to pay more for high quality food. It's worth more, you get more. A crucial step to accomplishing fundamental changes in your diet does occur at the cash register or between farm 
you and the farmer, to be barter and trade. Um, your overall monthly expenses decrease over time in two ways when you eat nutrient-dense foods. First, homemade meals and snacks are less expensive than pre-made industrial foods and low-quality restaurant foods. So cooking at home, you will save money even if you're spending more at the grocery shop for better quality food. And second, your health care costs decrease. Health care costs are not independent ex uh, expenditures from your food budget. Um, unlike, say, your mortgage and your car payment or tuition payment, which are independent of each other. You know, if your mortgage goes down, your, it doesn't affect your car payment. Whereas, if you pay more for your food, your health payments go down. So to wrap up, industrial foods create predictable results. You're normal if they make you ill. The fact is no amount or configuration of industrial foods is healthy for anyone, especially children. These quasi-foods are not designed to make you well. So move on to better foods and control what enters your body. So far, it's still up to you what you put in your mouth. Each bite of food matters. If you take care of your body, it will take care of you. And it's ultimately, your body is your first line of defense, not your sidearm. Um, beyond you, your food choices affect your community and your environment. What you buy and eat supports food producers and their methods. Follow your money and see what you're endorsing with your food choices. And if you don't like where you wind up, make some changes. Becoming a qualivore fits in well with the goals of the FSP. Your diet is a component of the quality of life and freedom. Eating high quality foods improves your health, your community, utilizes your rights, and it, it is your right to be free of agricultural toxins and processing adulterations and genetic engineering. It's your right to be free of corporate control of our food and unfair subsidies. It's your right to be free of environment destroying production practices which ruin soil, air, and water. It's your right to be free to farm without government intervention and invasion of privacy on your property. And lastly, it's your right to be free to choose what you want to eat. It's crucial to exercise these few rights we still have and thwart corporate control of our foods. Spend your money on actual nutrients and support your local economy. Here are seven ways to achieve this. Buy food from regional food producers, hunt and fish and forage, produce some of your own foods, save seeds, cook, establish local networks to barter and trade for food, and teach the next generations of farmers and cooks, pass on traditional methods. Become a whole libertarian by becoming a qualivore today. Start with governing yourself by eating foods that are free of the taint of corporations. And you'll taste freedom like you've never known before. <laughs> I, I, wanted you, I wanted to know if you know what the uh, judge that made that decision on raw milk is doing now. <laughs> he's, he's no longer a judge. Don't clap, because that's not a good thing. He's now working for a lobbyist firm. That's Monsanto. Oh, yeah. Oh. Interesting. Not surprising. He probably has a high health insurance premium. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say to the baker, to, to somebody who makes bread? What do you? <clears throat> what does the baker do to? You said something about flour. So what yeah. types of flour does? Um, like I, I use flaxseed. Is yeah. that a good I think a know, baker or? could source local um, ingredients for baking products and they can do different methods to make grains more digestible, and um, such as uh, soaking grains and using alternative grains rather than just wheat. Um, so there are many ways a baker can offer really nutritious foods. Um, I think that, that there are high quality baked goods. That I think it's neat to have a bakery, a freestanding baker. Um, Seattle has a lot of them, and they do sourdoughs, and, um, they have relationships with the farmers who produce their grains. And like you say, you can substitute nuts and seeds and grind them and, and maybe lower the carbohydrate and up the protein and fiber. Many ways to include um, baking in your qualivore lifestyle. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've found that helps is to get old cookbooks. 
that are designed for when real foods are around. Mm -hmm. I got a couple of cookbooks from my grandmother that were published in 1895. Um, and even then, sometimes you start halfway through the recipe. It's like I was going to do a goose for Christmas, and it starts with cut off the head and remove the feathers. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but you know, it, it, it has instructions for dealing with real food in a healthy way. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and, and the implements in her kitchen, that's really all we need. You don't need to keep redoing your kitchen with fancy gadgets that you hardly ever use. Cooking is pretty simple. You don't need a lot of tools. As a nutritionist, what's your perspective on metabolic typing? <laughs> you know, I think you can, you can get uh, really nitty-gritty and personal um, you know what I'm, I'm speaking to a crowd and giving something that applies to all of us but I think it is interesting to um, understand your system using testing and, and um, it, it's difficult to to assess the nutrients that we have we store them in various organs and tissues in different ways it's hard to know how um, full you are and then therefore which ones you might want to <coughs> what supplement with um, so I think that that's that's a personal journey that you can take that would be pretty interesting um, whether it would take you very far from eating basic whole good quality foods I'm, I'm not sure maybe it would give you a supplement regimen initially to replete sure can you name any restaurants that you would feel comfortable eating at? <laughs> I went to one in Osterville on the Cape called Earthly Delights, and that, that was a good place. And um, there's a new one, again, on Cape Cod and in Dedham called Wicked. But, you know, just like going to the farm environment, go to the restaurants. I've worked in many, and I rarely eat out. Have we heard of the five-second rule? No. <laughs> it exists. Um, Three the three second and you know, the, many people who work in kitchens are very hygienic, um, and with all the the food regulations about what a, a chef, even a, a, a right-minded chef, is able to access, it's it's a shame, but it's hard to make relationships with growers if you work in a restaurant um, because they are constrained by having the USDA stamp on their foods and things that they can say in their menu. So. I think it's entertaining to go to restaurants, but it isn't necessarily a great place to eat. <laughs> well said. Well, there, there is one in Concord called the Spoon Revolution, and it's, it used to be called um, it was a vegan restaurant, so a lot of meativores here <laughs> might not yeah. like it. But honestly, even if you have loved meat your entire life, you should go check it out. Because really, where is it? Phenomenal food. Can you bring right? your own meat? <laughs> 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 as long as you buy it at a local farm, <laughs> um, I think that that would be a consideration that Charles is that, Is it Ross's? Or it's or is it? it's yeah, Ross's. formerly called Ross's Vegan Kitchen, okay. but it's Ross's now is, yeah. called the Spoon Revolution, and it really is about the cleanest food you can find. Oh, that's great. So it's right in Concord, but... Very nice. Thank you. Um, what do you think about the produce at Trader Joe's and Whole Foods? Well, when I look at it through the Qualivore lens, <laughs> I think that um, oftentimes, first of all, those big grocery stores aren't necessarily filtering for you. I like that they label conventional and where things are grown or organic and where they're sourced. But, but even in those big shops, as convenient as they are, and I, I go in them, um, you, you have to look at each individual item and um, even ask questions. Sometimes they're sprayed with things just in the cases where they're um, displayed. So, I mean, it's better than industrial food or the worst quality industrial food, so I'm grateful they're there. But I can't really make a blanket statement about all the produce there. It's really an individual case. Some of them do go through a great effort to get more local um, fresh foods and and some of those aren't even uh, listed as organic and and yet they're worthy foods so again it's it's really hard to have a blanket statement about them yes what's your top choice um, for a sweetener then you know, getting away from sugar 
well, here in, in you know, maple syrup. Maple syrup. <laughs> um, you know, and honey. And um, I use stevia. Um, I don't use xylitol. I mean, it is an alcohol. I know that it's been used to sweeten, and, and it has some health be benefits, some say. And it's vegetarian. And it's vegetarian. That, you know, so, you know, it, it, food is personal. You know, so I use, I have a variety of every type of food. You know, so in my house, I have four or five sweeteners and four or five meats and um, as many types of fowl and fish I can find, that kind of thing. So I'm not stuck on one and this is the one and only best one. And as soon as I do that, there's another that comes along that, that does it better. So there isn't really a right answer there. Yes? Uh touched on some of the high quality fats that come from milk like butter and all of, you know all that stuff um, but we've kind of been uh, been bombarded for the past 25 years or so I don't know it's been longer than since I've been alive about how bad saturated fats are and uh, meats and bacon you know all this stuff mm -hmm. eggs mm -hmm. <laughs> and can you touch on how important actually the saturated fats are and that they are very helpful helpful I, I agree with you if they're, they're very they're high quality Right, if they're, if they're coming from a healthy cow right, or animal right. or pig or bacon or whatever. Um, yeah, I fully agree with you. I, I am not fat fearful. I'm not afraid of any fat. Um, well, well, no, I better, I better, yeah, my, uh, I gotta qualify that. No, I need industrial oils, I don't need those. So animal fats, I think, are a great part of the diet. I think they offer vitamins A and D, E and K. And, and nowadays, it's so common that people who have been cholesterol free need to supplement with vitamin A and D. So, uh, and I also don't think the science has proven it to be a risk factor for heart disease. So, and uh, look at the look at who's funding the science experiments and and, and follow the dollar. Um, but uh, more and more and more and more evidence shows that eating saturated fats is healthful. I, I just got to add to that. Uh, I've lost almost 80 pounds uh, in about a year. And I ate an awful lot of really high quality ribeye steak, an awful lot of high quality <laughs> bacon. Um, and uh, what I got rid of was the simple carbohydrates and things like that. And uh, everything you're being told is wrong. I mean, that's, that's all I can say. I mean, yeah. Well, congratulations, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. This does seem to be growing uh, yeah. factor. I was recently at a, at a business meeting and they were, we were putting bids for a national conference. And every place we went to, they every hotel talked about their local organic farm they have on the roof of the restaurants. And this is like a big awesome thing now. Um, uh, how do we, you know, I, I think food freedom may be the next fight we have. Oh, it's, on. It's, <laughs> it's on. It's how, it's on. Like, here in New Hampshire, we have, you know, we have very, very strict organic guidelines and we can have raw milk and there's tons of little farms and farms. Everywhere you go to the farm set in the summer, even in the big cities, they've got that they have them sometimes multiple times a week. How do we, how do we push this, wrong word, but how do we encourage this idea, because a lot of people have, you know, they, they have that, that initial cost complaint usually, like why would I spend, you know, five dollars for a gallon of raw milk versus two or whatever, you know, there's like a big cost thing and they don't see, you know, people don't see why it's just food. They don't, they don't see it. How do we, how can we promote this as, as a good thing even not, not even a political idea, but how do we how do we promote this? Because the more the more of it there is, the more available it will be. Yeah. And it'd be harder to stop it. Right, I agree. I think I think buying it yourself and being unafraid to spend a little bit more money on it, um, uh, advocating it in your schools, in your churches, um, serving that kind of food and, and helping people become aware of it. Um, just promoting the local producers and supporting them in every way. Anytime you know people are discussing, oh, where should we go for dinner? You know, if you're at a restaurant, tell them you want that kind of food to be offered. If you're, you know, instead of maybe the ice cream man going to the beach, you know, maybe we can come up with new in innovative little businesses to distribute really nourishing foods. I think teaching children is an important aspect of this. Educating in any way we can. Um, maybe getting. We have a great local farm on the Cape. It's called the Kuna Mesut Farm. And they do a lot of education. Um, and they have kids come and learn about farming and um, participate in growing foods. 
having little community patches where people grow their own foods and maybe give it to food banks and eat it themselves. Um, but just just being passionate about it, write about it in the local paper, and um, just help the maybe help the local producers who are really busy doing what they're doing best, and and help them in some way market themselves. Um, and then, like I say, you know, help others who worry about the food costs. Um, advise them to eat out less and to cook in more. So they might spend more on each individual item that they're preparing, but their overall cost per plate is less and their health care costs go down. I'd like to add that once you start trying it, I, mean, I got exposed to these ideas on so uh, the Spuddle podcast. I've been trying it for just a year. After a few months, I started to feel amazing. And that, that more than justifies. Yeah. And uh, about uh, placing sugar, once I started cutting out sugar and carbs, well, everything tastes sweet. Like, it's just bang with them. Uh, tea without any sugar is sweet. Um, cauliflower is sweet. Right. Yeah, that's Good for you. Yes. Eve, I'd like to uh, have you talk in terms of inflammation, because there's a lot of low quality foods that cause a lot of inflammation. A lot of the diseases they're seeing whether it's uh, uh, coronary artery disease, a lot of things they're finding out are actually because of inflammation, even the whole cholesterol uh, level scam. Yep. Uh, but they're saying now that the difference between your clogged arteries and not clogged arteries is not has nothing to do with the level of cholesterol, but the level of inflammation in your body. Yeah. So could you address that? With, in terms yeah, of and, and you, you mentioned fats, and, and um, high quality fats can help the um, integrity of the vasculature system. Uh, certainly the uh, omega-3 fatty acids can help the smooth muscle cells that line the vasculature dilate and um, the integrity of the heart muscle pump better. Um, uh, good foods just, they perform better. But I, I agree with you that just as we're finding out a lot of um, diseases are ultimately autoimmune diseases, um, inflammation is a huge part of many of the diseases we kind of thought were separate and um, uh, just their own sort of course. A lot of mental health issues are inflammation as well. I think um, a lot of the industrial foods that we eat do cause inflammation and um, from arthritis to dementia and um, simply getting on wholesome foods can um, provide you with the fats and the micronutrients so that you can uh, produce the enzymes and um, function properly. But, but you're right, I mean, you can, you can chase that down a rabbit hole and get very specific about specific compounds in foods that will um, help decrease inflammation. Absolutely. Um, but I really don't think there's any kind of disease process that isn't improved with high quality foods. Yes? So, um, Paleolithic versus primal diet, and uh, just like on your sense, just uh, from the food pyramid perspective, what is your. From the food pyramid? What do you think, um, uh, you know, if. if more veggies first, that's the biggest one, then after that meats, then oils, not oil. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's getting really specific and, and, you know, some people might do well on more vegetables than they currently eat and that, I think that's great. I also think that, you know, when you're initially on perhaps an industrial diet and you make you make a big step, say cut out the sugar, and you think, that's the step, oh yeah, I found the deal. And, um, but then uh, over some months, you might make a different um, change to your diet. So it's, it's an evolution, um, an evolution away from industrial products, and they're hidden in things. I mean, I just looked at a, a container of salt, not mine, I don't buy Morton's salt, but even it had sugar in it. I mean, it it's, it's amazing. And so, I, 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 you know, these diets, these fads of the moment, I think they have a lot to offer some people, and, and they're often a great launching off point. You, you're, it turns you away from what you've been doing that doesn't work, and, um, but, you know, a certain grams of carbohydrates and um, this grain versus that grain, I think, you know, if you get a variety in your diet and you don't focus too, too much on diet at all, I mean, just, just on eating a few good meals and being sated and forgetting about food altogether and then getting hungry and, um, you know, eating more like grandma used to, you know, three meals, if you miss lunch, you miss lunch, but you can probably survive and um, 
Um, you know, and if, if, if your grandma doesn't know what's on your plate, it, it probably isn't worth eating. So I, I think these diets of primal and paleolithic, they're, they're interesting theories, and, and, and they work for many people, predict, mainly those on industrial diets. I mean, anything is better than that. So from there, it gets kind of personal. Where's your region? What are your producers going to have for you? What's your initial state of health? What are your goals? What's your lifestyle like? Um, and all those factors then tweak a diet to become much more personal. And there, I think it's great to read a lot, and there are many, many people who are going to have great things to offer with their perspective on food. Yes? Uh, we talked about cost, but in terms of convenience, uh, I think probably a lot of the move to industrial food besides the subsidies, I think externalized costs is just as our standard of living has gone down. Uh, you know, people have to work and they don't have time. Uh, is there anything going on to uh, try to make uh, this lifestyle more convenient for someone who's interested and can devote themselves to go to farms and inspect themselves? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the first thing is to throw out your television. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, this whole, of, you know, we came from, what, the primates, you know, and, and you, you've seen the progression of, of people, um, humans, going from, like, the primate, and then standing erect, and then walking, and now we're back to this. <laughs> you know, get away and, and get in the kitchen, and you, I, I'm, I'm impressed by the man out here, Mandrake, who is, um, he's got these great big boiled eggs covered in um, local sausage, I and mean, that, that's a convenient food. <laughs> I was just thinking, like in terms of like, uh, uh, if there was an independent standard, like we, we we buy certified humane meat, and that's a pretty good standard. They see that they're an independent group, and they go out, and we can just look for that label. Great. Yep. I think that's great when food producers or stores. I know Whole Foods have their different grades, and that information is valuable. Um, as long as you really understand the definition and they're, they're parsing out every word, so you do have to make sure you're not getting duped, because sometimes it sounds better than it is, like with whole, whole foods. Um, I don't mean the, the business, I just mean whole foods. Often they are whole and whole. The, all the parts are in there. I don't know that they find their way back to where they were, but um, so I think, I think you're right. I mean, convenience in this day and age is a very important thing to people. But I think you know it's up to us to prioritize, and and you got to start here, and then get out in the world. Um, and if you take care of yourself, I think I think you'll you'll be able to stay awake long enough to make breakfast in the morning, or um, do that little thing like reach in the freezer and pull out something to thaw for dinner, or soak the rice so it cooks quicker. Um, there are little ways to get to get it more convenient. Yeah.